Yeah, I started recording now. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, why don't we start with a round of introductions first? Uh, so I'm Tina. I'm a fourth year NSCI majoring in MI. Really happy to be here, and I hope that our workshop will help you guys to get started on your project. I'm Lucy. Everything else is the same. Also, <laughs> here, also in MI. Also very happy um, to be here, and uh, we're. I think we're trying to give some intuition on what ML is and kind of like a basic overview of it. Um, there is not too much technical detail, so hopefully, I think it'll, it'll be easy to like easy to understand. Start. Can you guys see the slides? Yeah. Okay, cool. So first of all, we want to address is what is the difference between machine learning and like traditional algorithms? So um, in traditional algorithms, when you're trying to find something, you have to define some kind of features. Like if I try to find a circle, triangle, something in my, in like say if I have an image classification task and I try to find if this is a cat and want to try to somehow uh, write the code that so that my code can, can find maybe triangle errors or like eyes of a cat or something like that. So, and then um, I can assemble them together and say, oh, this is a cat classifier. I'll be able to find something. But then to do this, you'll have to know how to find the cat's ears, the cat's eyes, was by processing the raw data, which is not easy in many cases because you're having just a bunch of zero like numbers and you're trying to uh, detect edge detection, shape detection, all those are um, difficult tasks in computer vision traditionally. And so to do anything that is useful, you will need, you often need a lot of expert knowledge in the field field to try to uh, identify what features you're looking for. And machine learning is different because um, in, in machine learning, you don't define exactly what you're trying, what exact features you're trying to look for. Instead, you have, a, you have an algorithm and then you feed it lots and lots and lots of examples. And then hopefully it'll gradually pick up and figure out what are the features to look for by itself. Um, this is uh, uh, being really successful since 2012, and uh, it outperforms uh, most of the traditional algorithms um, with um, some tunings. And most of the time in machine learning, what the features they pick up, it's not always interpretable to us human, which is also why it is very hard for us to write it um, so that algorithm does the same thing. And uh, sometimes they'll find some kind of pattern that is based on bias in the data set rather than the actual things you're trying to figure out. I'll go over some of those examples later. And uh, however, if we have enough data, the, 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 the problem here is you, need, you usually need lots and lots of data for this to work. Um, but if we have enough, then machine learning can outperform most traditional algorithms without any expert knowledge. So when we talk about machine learning, typically there are two categories for learning, supervised versus unsupervised. So in our case, we're just going to focus on supervised learning today, um, but it's still very useful to know the difference between them. So in the, since in the case of supervised learning, we know the ground truth. So we can always compare our model's performance against the correct labels. And for supervised learning, classification and regression are two tasks um, for this kind of learning. And the main difference between them is that for classification, we are trying to map input into discrete labels. So for example, in the case of object detection, when you look at an image, is this a cat, a dog, a chair, a person? So those are discrete categories. Whereas for regression, your model is mapping the input to continuous output. So for example, if you're trying to predict 
stock price using historical data, or for example, predicting rainfall. Um, so in this case, both of these tasks have labeled data. So they are examples of supervised learning. And then for unsupervised learning, we don't know the ground truth labels, but this is still useful to do because we can find out if there are hidden patterns in the data. So um, in machine learning, it's really common to, for example, cluster large amounts of text data because it's not really practical for humans to label hundreds and thousands of articles. Um, it takes too much time. And a lot of the time you're creating the data set yourself, for example, from websites. So you're not going to have any of these ground truth labels. So in that case, we can still do clustering and see if, for example, if there are any top keywords or really important topics within our text data, and then that can give us more insight into what we're dealing with. So this is kind of an overall pipeline of the steps to doing a machine learning project. So we start with data collection, um, or if you're lucky, you don't have to collect data and you're using some data sets that you are able to find online. There are a lot of open source data sets out there. Um, so if that's an option, then you don't have to collect it yourself. And then for data pre-processing, um, whether it's text data or data you collect from sensors, a lot of the time you have to do some cleaning um, before you can proceed to the next step. And then we can train and compare the performance of different machine learning models um, and also evaluate it on test data and troubleshoot our model. And once we pick out the best model, we can then apply it um, and then hopefully use it in a different test case. Right, first of all, in machine learning, it's very important to understand what kind of data you have. You need to look carefully at your data set to make sure it is the best you can get. So machine learning models are very lazy. If there is some obvious clues in your data, it will not try to learn more complex patterns. For example, if I have this data set of cats and dogs and I'm feeding all of them into my machine learning model and say, oh, tell me, uh, try to ask it to define, to find out which ones are cats and which ones are dogs. But then if I didn't collect my data carefully and all my cat data are black cats, and I'm all, all, my white, uh, all, my, all my dog data are white dogs, and when I put it into machine learning model, you can't specify what you are asking it to find. So at that point, your machine learning model is going to, instead of learning the difference between cats and dogs, because it's very difficult to figure out for um, which, um, like what different features each, uh, uh, each creature has and things like that. So instead, what is much more likely is that my machine learning model is just going to say, oh, this, this image is darker, so it's probably a cat. That image is lighter, it's probably a, it's a dog. This is based on, this is because all the, all the example I give, the, I give to my model are biased. Therefore, my model learns about the bias instead of the true um, distribution of um, the different features on the, on the, on the, on the animals. Yeah, this is what I just said. I forgot that it's another slide. Yeah, and when you try to use that kind of, if you try to use that kind of a model in real life, it won't, it, like, I, I think you can tell that it will not work well. So let's say a different scenario uh, is uh, I have an unbalanced class. Say if 95% of my data sets are just different cats and uh, only 5% of um, the data set is dog. And then when I feed it into a model without looking at my data set, I look at my classifier, my classifier is outputting correctly 95% of the time. And I think, oh, my classifier is great. But the reality is because the class is so unbalanced, my classifier can get, and get a very high uh, accuracy by just saying everything is cat. And uh, because that's, all, that's most of my examples I give it. So, so at that point, when you're trying to put it in use in real life, that will also not work. Um, so you need, to, you need to look at how um, is your data representative of all the classes you want, to, you want it to classify? Is the data um, biased in some, some way? 
and is that as the data um, uh, containing just the, uh, like not not containing any access clues that the the machine learning model might want to pick up those ones that you don't want them to pick up um, and um, yeah and in, yeah, just... in class sorry go ahead lucy in class in balance case sometimes there's different ways to mitigate those for example you can pen penalize your model for classifying a uh a, uh a, Cat for having for, for outputting everything as cat and then trying to uh, weigh the dog class more uh, heavily when you're trying to when you're trying to feed it into your model. So you say the dogs are worth more points than the cats. So so that you can make sure your your model does not blindly trying to guess everything for cats. Yeah, I also just wanted to add that. Um, it's also important to make sure that distribution of your training and test data are also similar. Otherwise, you might also see like a huge gap in performance if the classes are really imbalanced. Yes. Right. Um, as I mentioned before, you there's some um, you, you need to to make sure that your data set is balanced and is best as it can be, you need to do some pre-processing usually. And uh, in pre-processing, usually you need to remove any unique ID or like extra information about the data. Say if I have a data set that has a lot of different images and then has an image ID associated with them. So in my model might just learn to memorize all those image IDs and say, oh, uh, ID one is a cat, ID two is a dog. And now, and now it does. Once it does that, it's it, it just won't it, it just won't generalize all the other things that it can it can try to learn from the image because that's the easy way out for the model. Um, so you need to get rid of any information the that is not needed to do the task, and also you um, ideally you want everything to be equally represented. Re represented. Um, sometimes you can uh, have. You can also have da um, data augmentation where you um, find underrepresented class and then try to create some more data based on what you already have. And uh, um, the best case is that you can collect more data to make your data set better if you find something is not uh, is underrepresented, but it's not always possible. So there's a lot of techniques you can. Um, uh, you can find online to to help you um, pre-process your data to make a better data set for your task. Data set is very important for uh, machine learning um, because if you don't, if you have garbage data set, whatever you uh, you, you can only get um, a garbage classifier. There is just no way you can get a better a, a wonderful model out of some if you don't have good data. Um, yeah, on other common um, techniques used in data set um, pre-processing is normalization um, and to make sure that you, you don't bias towards certain features than the other ones. Because some, for example, if I have a data set that has people's, um, I guess, people's salary, and maybe people's height or something like that, the, salary, the number for salaries are going to be naturally way higher than your height, right? And then when you give it into the model, because models are just um, mathematical um, function manipulator, something like that. So um, the because you had a very high number in there, then in the, initially it will probably dominate all the other, dominate other features. You have a high, so that your model will only look at the features with a very high number, for example, your salary or something. And if you don't, if you don't want it to do that, make sure you normalize everything before you put it into your model. And very big and small numbers cause instabilities in, in calculation as well. So there are actually a lot of different kinds of machine learning models, but today we're just going to focus on neural networks. Um, so other kinds of machine learning models would include support vector machine, SVMs, um, and random forest. 
So neural networks are typically said to have greater complexity than these models. And another advantage of neural networks is that they can model nonlinear relationships. So that allows you to capture um, more nuances in your data set. And neural networks are modeled loosely on the human brain. So it consists of a collection of Sorry, am I falling off or? No, I think, Tina, I think Tina. you cut out. Tina, here. Um, and then we get the output from the node. Wait, so, Tina, your sound was cut off since you said, uh, like once you said um, uh, neural nets are modeled loosely on human brain. Oh, sorry. Was I cut off? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so neural networks are modeled loosely on the human brain. So it consists of a bunch of nodes that are really similar to neurons. Um, so on the right here, you can see that a node takes in a bunch of inputs. It applies a mathematical operation here. So this is a sum symbol, and then a bias is added. And then the F is an activation function. And after you do all of that, you get a bunch of outputs. So um, this is similar to a neuron in the sense that the dendrites are kind of similar to the inputs and then um, the mathematical operation happens over here and then you get the outputs here. As you can see, I am no neuroscience expert, <laughs> but we always learn about the analogy of comparing a neuron um, to the nodes in a neural network. So let's take a closer look at the node. So as we saw earlier, it takes in a bunch of inputs and on each of these, in each of these channels, there is a weight attached to it. So these weights are associated with the node. They don't really depend on what you put in here. So the node will calculate this sum using the weights and your inputs and the B is the bias. So you get this sum and then you apply activation function. So there are different kinds of activation functions that are typically used um, and they're all nonlinear. So some really common ones are sigmoid, tan age, and ReLU. You can see that um, they kind of apply different scaling factors. For example, scaling the value to between zero and one or between negative one and one. And then this one is just non-negative. Um, and so these weights and biases um, the weights here and the bias term here, these are all optimized during training. So you're continuously adjusting these numbers while you train your model. And once you finish training, these weights are fixed. And then when you feed in the test data, um, the best weights and biases that you got during training, you apply them to the test weights and that gives you your predictions. I also wanna point out that, oh. I also want to point out that this is um, very similar to the, um, if you look at all the activation functions, it's very similar to the concept of, of action potential in the neurons, where you had nothing, you, you'll have nothing going on until it's suddenly you, once you reach a threshold, which is approximately zero here, then you'll have some kind of output. And so the first kind of neural network that we're going to look at is the multi-layer perceptron. This is the most bare bones basic kind of neural network. It's just composed of a bunch of nodes that we saw earlier. And you can see here, every node is connected to all of the nodes on the previous layer, as well as all of the nodes on the layer after it. So this is why we call it a fully connected layer because all of these nodes are connected together. And then the layers in between the input and output are called the hidden layers. They're just sandwiched in between the input and output. So we have an example for um, a multilayer perceptron, but before we go to this example, do you guys have any questions? Um, no, not really. So basically we should be, cause I think with us, we're gonna be collecting, our, we're gonna be trying to collect our own data as well. 
So we should be like collecting data from a bunch of different scenarios in order to avoid like the biases and like have at least, cause our thing is like falling. So we should be having like a lot of not falling versus like some falling. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's okay because you can resolve in class, like the imbalance with different weights and um, there's techniques to do that. That's all right. As okay. long as you, as long as you cover different uh, activities in life that might be confused with falling, I think that would be good. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so let me go to the example. Can you guys see my screen? Um, so for this example, we're using Google Colab. In case you haven't seen this before, it's kind of similar to a Python notebook where it's really good for displaying visualizations or if you just wanna um, look at your data, this is really useful. And the advantage of Google Colab is that you don't have to install these packages locally. Um, so Colab already has some of the packages pre-installed and you can always install it every time you boot up this environment. So there's no problem of trying to sync up different environments between team members. Um, so that is kind of the advantage of using this. So let's just run through this then. The, uh, <clears throat> we already run those. So the um, output for each code section is just displayed on, underneath. Do you want to run it? Do you want to run it now? Yeah. You can just run off. Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> just, just take the output as it what it should look like. Um, you can try to run it yourself. It should be real, really easy. You can just go up to the runtime and um, press. Uh, um, yeah, you can do run all. Run all. So this example is based off of a tutorial we found online, um, which uses um, a data set containing images of digits, so zero to nine. Um, and then we're building a fully connected classifier to determine what digit it is by looking at the different pixels. Um, so in this multi-layer perceptron, we have an input layer a hidden layer and also an output layer. And then. This is just loading the data set. Yeah, so we so if you load in this data set from sklearn. And it contains, um, if you look at the shape, you can tell that it contains a thousand, 1,797 images of Henderson digits. Each of them are just eight by eight. Um, your size. And then we, we can see some of, examine some of the data ourselves. And then see it's kind of, most of them are like kind of blurry. So it, it, it will be, if you're trying to hand write a, a algorithm to figure out what they, what um, the digits the are, it might be very difficult because um, like all the numbers are written in a different, might, might be written on a different location some of them are more blurry than the other ones. And um, so it, it could be very difficult and time consuming to trying to figure out uh, which digit is which. So, so we, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's okay, you go. So we reshape uh, the array we got earlier into a 2D array, so we flatten um, essentially the image into like a 64 um, dimension vector. So you have eight pixel by eight pixels. So that gives you four, 64 pixels in total. Just flatten that into one giant vector. And this is the shape after you flatten everything. And the targets are just the actual class where they belong to. So this is the label data set. You have what the, um, what the true value is. And uh, then because 
Um, so um, it's um, in machine learning uh, because you're doing basically um, adding functions and uh, trying to look at the output of functions. So sometimes you need to consider is is my is this value I'm looking at is this a continuous value or is this actually a categorical value? So in this case, when we have uh, digits one uh, digit from zero to nine, uh, is uh, it is a, this is a categorical uh, value because one and two has nothing to do with each other. Like if you have if you have something um, that is that that the target is two, it's not two times as something as the the the, the image that is representing has written one. So they they don't have a relationship with each other. And if you predict something like 1.5, it, it does not make any sense. It's not saying it's between one and two or something like that. So what we want to do is that we want to change the, the, um, this value, um, this target class uh, number from zero to nine. Instead of giving it to the model as zero to nine, we want to um, encode them into a 10 dimension, 10 dimension um, vector to tell that um, to tell the neural network model that um, this first th this zero here has nothing to do with the one there has nothing to do with the two there so we'll put them each of them into a different dimension um, um, to decouple the, the the implication of the number. If you're confused by it, look up one hot encoding. Yeah, so once we do this, we can predict the probability of um, an image belonging to a class. So the maximum would be one and the minimum would be zero. So ideally, if your model is perfect and you get an image with a zero digit on it, the target would be this. And then you also predict something like this. So maybe your model is really good, but we'll say, oh, the probability of this one is 0 0.99. And then the rest is um, a lot smaller. So we can say this is the most likely class and that's our prediction. And this also allows the model to say if the model is like this thing might be a one or it might be a nine, it can give you a probability for this to be a one to be a nine. But if you give it a continuous value from zero to nine, then you, what is your model gonna output something like five? Then that, that doesn't make any sense either because it's not trying to predict that this is a um, five. So here we've apply one hot encoding to these labels. So you can see if uh, the label is zero, you have a one here. If it's nine, you have it here. So each one of these vectors corresponds to a label here. And now we split our data into training and testing. Um, so technically we can also have a validation data set. So, but we don't do it here. This is just a very simplified example where we train on the train data and then we evaluate on the test data. So two separate data sets, um, the model never sees the testing data until we do evaluation. Usually it's about 20 to 30% where you um, withhold for validation test. Here it's a little bit, um, it's, it's kind of arbitrary. We just decided the first 1000 image. Um, usually that's not the case in, um, in, um, in when you're training your own model. Usually you want to give it more than, this is about a little bit over a half of the data. You usually you want to give it about 70% of the data. And then for the neural network, we're using Keras. So it's using a TensorFlow engine. Keras is kind of just the neural network library. So it just gives us a bunch of really nice wrappers and we can create um, the architecture very easily. So first of all, we create an input layer. Um, dimension is 64 because the flattened image is 64 pixels. And then we create a hidden layer. So dense just means that it's fully connected. Um, so 
each node in this layer is connected to everything from the input and also connected to everything from the output. We also apply the activation function here, uh, sigmoid. It's one of the really common ones that I introduced earlier. And then finally, in the output layer, this is also a fully connected layer. And then we also apply a soft max. This is just to scale the different probabilities for each class so that it adds up to one. So we have our model, and then we can also print out a summary of what the layers look like. Yeah, usually you have more hidden layers, but this is a very simple example. So we only have one. So here uh, they also use regularization and we're not going to go into a lot of detail on this. And then when you finally compile the model, you define a loss function, um, an optimizer, and also a metric. Loss function is just to measure how far away your projection is from the ground, like from the real values. And there are different ways to do it. Cross entropy is one of the most common ones um, you can use. If you're interested, you can look up other ones as well. Yeah, and also these values, these can be tuned as well, which we'll explain later. These are called hyperparameters. This is the learning rate, uh, the momentum for this optimizer. So this is a gradient descent optimizer. It's essentially, it's trying to find the minimum of your loss function. You're trying to uh, minimize your loss so that you get to, you get as close to the prediction. So you get as close to the target labels as possible. And so once we have that, we can train our network. So batch size is um, batch size is the option of dividing your data set into like, small batches, and then you feed it into the network um, one batch at a time. Basically, your your model will look at some examples, and then you'll do a calculation about how the, how far the prediction is from your uh, true labels and your your prediction output right now by your model. And then it will um, and then it will do an update step to try to optimize your model. Batch slice just means how many models you look at um, before you do an update step. Um, the bigger the batch size is, the faster you go through all the training examples, but um, you might need to do more training too. It's complicated. I think I would recommend looking that up as well. Um, common batch sizes are somewhere within 128. It usually are, it can be smaller as well. You, you should try it yourself to see which one works best for your data and your model. Those numbers you can change and then just observe the effect. Yeah, just to add on to that, for example, if you have a batch size of one, you're essentially updating everything after every image. So the disadvantage of that might be your model will fluctuate wildly because it's trying to adjust to every image you send it. So that's why we will want maybe a slightly larger batch size so that we can um, fit to everything in that entire batch and then apply an update and then do that for each batch instead of for just one image only. And then epoch is basically how many times we run through the whole data set. So if it's 50, we're going through all of the data 50 times. And here we plot the change in the model accuracy and the loss um, through, the, through the epochs. Um, you can see how the model improves if you follow the blue line, that's the training data, um, training accuracy, you can see it like generally just improves with your training. But if you look at the yellow line, which is the test data, those data our model have never seen, before, like have not seen during training. 
Um, so it's a better representation of what it might experience in the future when you try to deploy it onto the uh, data it has never seen before. Um, and then you will see that it's not performing as good as the training because the model have seen the training data so many times, it kind of starts to memorize some subtle things in there and make it performs better on training data rather than um, testing data. And yeah, just to clarify, the loss here is just what you get from your loss function. Initially, it's super high, but as you optimize your model more and more, it should get lower and lower until like you see for the training set, at the very end, you have your lowest loss. Um, and ideally, this should happen for the test set as well. So it should um, decrease and then maybe plateau as you go on for longer times. So let's look at one of the prediction output by the model. If you, um, I think this is just a random index we, we selected. Look at, look at the vector produced um, um, a little bit above the mouse right now. Um, there, yeah, you can see the predict, the probable, this is essentially the probability of your model saying, um, first one, the first number here is saying, this is the probability of this image belonging to um, class zero. And the second one's the probability of this image belong to class one. And then you're just trying to find which one is, has the highest probability and they say, oh, this is probably most likely to be what this model is. If you see here, it, um, one, two, three, five, it says it, it's, um, it's way higher than all the, the rest. The model is pretty certain that this image is a five. And um, let's see if this image is a five. And it is. Yeah, so you can see the image visualized here. It's a very blurry five. So we can also compute the accuracy score, which is just the number of examples that we predicted correctly. Um, for this, you can use sklearn library, and it has this function called accuracy score. Um, so your network. Oh, go ahead. Your network is not a deterministic um, algorithm. Uh, usually when you're trying to optimize it, and when you're trying to split the data, there is some randomness involved. And it is recommended that you have some randomness involved. Um, and uh, so every time when you train a model, maybe the accuracy is gonna be a little bit different. Usually it shouldn't differ by a lot. So sometimes you would like to uh, run it a few times to check the average of the algorithm to make sure you're not just getting super lucky or unlucky um, because of the randomness. And yeah, before we compute the accuracy score, we first have to get the best class. So this is what we're doing with argmax um, because earlier we saw this is just a bunch of probabilities. So we want to get the index of this one basically. And so this is the accuracy that we got on the test set. And furthermore, we can also visualize our predictions in a confusion matrix. So here, um, these numbers correspond to the true labels, and then these ones correspond to your predictions. So what that means is, for example, over here, the true label is an eight, but my model predicted a two. So in most of the examples we predicted correctly, which is why you see these large values on the diagonal here. Um, but this is still really valuable because it can tell us if there are classes that are easily confused by the model, then sometimes you can go back and look at your data or do some pre-processing to get rid of um, factors that might be that might be confusing your major your model. This is why it's called a confusion matrix. Yeah, so that's the end of this example. Do you guys have any questions? So when we go back, like with the confusion matrix, we should be going back with um, like not our testing data, but like our training data only still. You will look at your overall data set, usually. Like, and, and, and okay. your 
and test data are just randomly selected from your data set portion of okay. being used for training and then the other portion for testing. So okay. if, if something is affecting the the model, it usually occurs in all the data. It usually not it's not just one or two data points that have something like that. Um, you're you're probably fine if it uh, only happens in very rare cases. Um, but if something that if say my model confuses three and two twenty percent of the time, then it might be worth to look into why those numbers are why are they so uh, similar and is it is there a diff a way for for me to help the model understand their difference? Okay, cool. Let's switch back to the slides. We, there are also different structures for um, machine learning models. Uh, so a multi-layer perceptron or the fully connected layers, those ones are the most basic components of them that we just covered. Um, and CNN and RN are two of the more common, slightly more complicated versions uh, uh, stru structures that you can find. And there's uh, some wildly uh, different ones and uh, very complicated models as well you can find in, in papers if you're interested. A lot of papers also provide code that you want if you want to try to replicate something or try to use the results. Um, we're just going to quickly uh, conceptually go over what CNN and RNs are. The mathematics behind it is a little bit more difficult and I don't think we can cover it in um, in an hour, so would recommend you to look it up if you if you are interested. So for CNNs, um, one one thing that one trouble that we had with multilayer perception is that each each of my neurons are connecting to uh, this certain location. So the location matters. Where the first, second, third cell matters uh, to your um, to the model. But sometimes if you have something that is off center or some uh, features, maybe you don't want to uh, um, let the model care too much about where exactly this thing is at um, in your data. Um, you can use convolutional neural networks. Um, here um, on the left, you can see an example of uh, how this works. Um, so, it has a filter of here we have a three by three filter you can see on the blue um, section where it's the shaded area is three by three. So here there's a um, and, and we do a convolution computation with this uh, each of the three by three area of the original data and then we the result is recorded on the top in the green. So this way. Um, this way, the effect of where exactly the feature is is not as obvious because we do the same um, operations throughout the whole image. We we'll basically scan through this image to try to find where uh, if a feature exists. Um, this helps us to eliminate the locality of the features, and we can look at um, input at multiple scales. So it depends on how big your filter is. Here is three by three. You can have a bigger filter. We can have a more sparse filter. And so you can examine the input at different scales for different sizes um, of features. And uh, the results, the, the green thing on top is called a feature map. Usually you pass this into um, other, more layers of multi-layer perceptions and then come up with the result. If you look at the structure here on the bottom, you can see that um, so in the first few layers, you see the, um, the convolution operation where you have one spot correspond to like a, a filter, like a big chunk here on a car. And then after a few of these, and at the end, you still pass it into this classification section where it's the same as what we see before, just different layers of um, fully connected layers. And then at the end, you output the point. 
it's a little bit hard to wrap your head around at first. I will, you might want to spend more time looking at this. Yeah, so uh, it's essentially kind of like a scanning window. So it allows you to scan over the entire image if there's something you're looking for. Um, so for example, in the case of object detection, maybe if I want to detect a cat, I want to detect the cat even if it's in the corner of the image um, instead of just in the middle. So this would be something I would want to try. And then another kind of neural network would be uh, recurrent neural networks, RNNs. So these are typically used for time series and sequential data, such as text. So such as the example here, you're able to analyze a series of input one at a time instead of taking in the whole vector, um, as we saw in the multilayer perceptron. And so in the RNN, the output of your current step is dependent on the input and also the output of your previous step. So this kind of allows you to maintain a memory of everything that came before. So as you can see here, um, we are able to maintain some of this as we go along the network, even though it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is a problem. If you have a really long series, you're not able to remember everything from a long time ago. So in that case, there's a variation called LSTMs. So this kind of RN would do a better job of remembering um, over longer sequences. And so this is similarly to CNNs, you can also combine an RN with, for example, a multilayer perceptron at the end. For example, if you're doing text classification, this is something that you can try. So um, if you're dealing with time series data, I would encourage looking into RNNs. Great. Um, training validation testing. So in the previous example, we see we only had training and testing, but usually there's actually a, a another set of data we also hold. Um, so we, we usually split a, a data set in three ways. Uh, most of them are going to be in training data and the rest um, validation and testing. And uh, this is because we want to make sure that um, the model will work when we um, deploy it in real life rather than just on the training data we have. So if we show the, a model all the data we have without holding some for testing or validation, then sometimes we cannot tell the difference between uh, if the model is memorizing everything or if it's learning to generalize. Um, if, like, if you think of an example is that if you have, if you have um, a correct, um, if, if you write, a, if, if you give a correct assignment to the TA, the, but the TA doesn't know if you just copied it from the answer key or if you answered all of them, if you are able to generalize, know the information and write it yourself. So and that's why we need testing. So th this is why we train the model with some of the data and reserve some it has never seen before for, tests, for evaluating its performance. Um, the training data, um, the training, training data, which is the majority of the data, we use it to, we use it to find the best weights and biases um, of the model uh, by doing optimization and uh, gradient descent. And validation data, we use it to tune the hyperparameters. So all the numbers, uh, parameters you see for um, the uh, for the op what kind of op optimizer you use what kind of models you use, what kind of learning rates, what kind of batch size, all those, you want to um, tune those and then you want to observe um, how the model performs on the validation data. But because you tune this according to the performance on the validation data, this means you're also trying to find the best um, for your validation data um, and uh, you can, um, overly adjust your model to fit what you have for validation as well, um, similar to um, training. So you have a final set of it for testing um, to make a, a, a brand new set it has never seen before and, uh, I, and you have never tuned according to the result before to make sure the results you get is, um, is as, as accurate as it can be to um, unseen data. This is your best estimate of your model's performance in the real world. 
So in terms of optimizing performance, um, some common problems might be model overfitting and underfitting. I think Lucy will explain those more on the next slide. Um, obviously collecting more data is helpful and also ensuring that you have balanced classes. So either using um, upsamp oversampling, undersampling, um, or applying different weights to classes. So for example, um, if this where class is more important to me, maybe I want to place more weight on it in my classifier. And there's also the option of hyperparameter tuning using the validation set. Um, these are just different things that we can tune, learning rate, batch size, um, the number of layers and the size of layers of your model, as well as the optimizer and loss function used. So I guess one other thing I would add is for the learning rate. Um, if you have a really high learning rate, um, you might overshoot in your model. So your model is trying to find the optimal position um, while looking at the loss function. So this is kind of corresponding to the step size. If your step size is too big, you might miss the best point entirely. Whereas if you have a really tiny learning rate, it might just take you a really long time to get to that optimal point. So this is something you would have to test out with your own data set. Yeah. Um, if you have, and also if you have a very tiny learning rate, you might also get stuck in a, in a local minimum instead of possible other local minimums you can find, or maybe the global minimum. So underfitting, overfitting, and generalization, right? This is the most important concept of um, machine learning uh, model tuning, I guess. Um, so underfitting is that when you have um, too simple of a model to actually have a good fit of your data. So if you look, if we look at the, the data points I have here, so it obviously looks like a very, um, a, it's okay. <laughs> because it looks like it always lo looks like a um, uh, line that's generated by like something similar to a curve. But if I hypothesize and say, oh, my model should be something that's super simple, it should be just a straight line, then this case will you'll have a bad um, you you'll just have a bad performance, and then no matter how much you train your model. Um, and uh, in neural networks, what you often see is that on your loss or on, on, on your loss graph, you will see like, uh, this is not too bad of a case, but sometimes you will see a giant, um, uh, you, you will see that the, the model just does not perform well at all. Um, for example, if you have a, bi a binary classifier, if I want to um, look at an image, image and say if it's a cat or if it's a dog, and your final accuracy is somewhere between 50%, that means your model is not uh, is not comp your model is not complicated enough to learn anything important to differentiate the difference. Um, and uh, if you and uh, if you look at on the very other side, when I have a super complicated model that just try to fit every single point I have, um, is that the picture on the top right? And you'll you'll probably be right to think that this is not a good. Uh, this is not a good prediction either, because in the and and when I have another data another data point, it's probably not going to follow this very very curvy curve. I have. And in uh, in machine learning, what you see is that the the training data will continue to get better and better and better as you as you keep training because you have this complicated model where you can fit everything perfectly on your curve. But your validation, the 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 validation accuracy is going to be really bad because um, your your model this the, your model just won't perform well on any unseen data points. And what you're looking for is <laughs> what you're looking for is a good fit where you have training and validation um, loss and accuracies on those two curves as possibly. Uh, as similar as possible and while maintaining a high accuracy. This can be very difficult depending on what model, um, it, what tasks you're trying to achieve and requires probably a lot of hyper, uh, hyper parameter tunings. Um, but yeah, that's the ideal. 
if you have uh, underfitting, usually you either need more training time or or which is which just means you have you want to run it for for more epochs than you what than you decided before, or you want to have a bigger more complex model. Um, it can be more layers or a bigger or a bigger size layers that you have. And uh, on the other end, you want more, probably more pre-processing, or maybe just stop the training before it, um, the data start to um, overfit onto um, the, all the small points. Here, you can't really see it, but actually after, um, there's a pointer, there's no pointer, but after a certain point, the validation actually got worse over time. Um, and as the training get better, and you might want to just stop the stop the model training before that happens. So that might be as good as you can get. So lastly, I just want to talk about some evaluation metrics. So we saw earlier in the example that you can use a confusion matrix to compare a classifier's predictions against your ground truth labels. Um, so that can be really helpful if you want to see how the misclassifications are distributed. And the recon precision are really useful, especially if you have imbalanced classes. So precision is looking at what percentage of my positive predictions are correct, whereas recall is what percentage of actual positives was identified by my model. So this can be a little bit tricky to wrap your mind around. So I find this to be really helpful, um, where this is the actual label, it's false or true, and then your predicted label, which is um, also zero one. So here, a true positive means that you predicted true and the label is also true. And then a false positive is my model predicted true, but the actual label is false. So similarly for these other two cells. And then recall is using the true positive divided by um, the false negative plus true positive. So you're looking at uh, my true positives divided by all of the um, all of the samples that have label one in the actual, sorry, all the data that have actual label one in your data set. Whereas precision, you're looking at true positive divided by um, false positive plus true positive. So you're looking at um, true positive divided by all the samples that your model predicted to be true. So yeah, I find that if you have this chart by your side when you try to compute this, it can help you to better understand what these different scenarios mean. Um, some other metrics would be specificity and also F1 score. F1 score could be really helpful in terms of combining uh, recall and precision. It allows you to look at the trade-off between them. And then accuracy is just what we did earlier um, when we computed the accuracy in our example for the digit prediction. So I think that's the end of our presentation. Um, just this. wanna put this, if, 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 you, if you think of your example of trying to predict if anybody, if someone's falling or not, I guess um, precision is trying to say, oh, and of all the times I predict this person's falling, um, are, they, are they actually falling or not? And recall is say of all the time this person actually fought, how many times did I catch? Did I did my model actually uh, catch that they're falling? So if you can have a really high recall if your model is saying this person's falling all the time, because you catch all the time they're they're falling. You can have a really high precision of your model just predict maybe if you have this person falling fifty times, but your model predict one of the falling correctly and only that one, you will have a high precision because your model is correct at the time it predicts if this person is falling. Um, but it's also not very good because most of the time you just missed. So you want a combination of a uh, few of these metrics. And any questions? No, um, yeah, like not right now, but thank you guys so much for like organizing this and giving like all of these tips and stuff. It was really, really helpful for our project.